Stevie Sun. Congratulations to you. And there's other people there also in Facebook. Please make sure and say hi to us as you're there. Again, if you're on YouTube, whether you're on YouTube at a later date or you're on YouTube now, what's going on there on YouTube? Please use frame sequence for four seconds or less. Currently, frames are not being sent often. I'm not quite sure what that is. Something's coming up on Facebook saying something weird to me. So, I'm not quite sure why that is. But, hopefully it's okay. Let me know there on YouTube, guys, if everything's okay. Because YouTube is sending me a funny signal. Uh, there's two people in there. So it's sending me a funny signal, so please let me know. If you're in the chat there on YouTube, please say something there. Has YouTube decided to change things again? Every time they change things, it messes us up on us. Please say hi if you're here. Again, Jamie, will you tell me, is the sound okay if you're still there on Facebook? Will you tell me that you're, you hear the sound clear? Just tell me, just say sound is clear. There's four people there in Facebook. Please let me know. Unless YouTube is giving me loads of hassles again. Whoever's in Facebook right now, would you do us a favor and just let me know that the sound is okay, that you're hearing me clear. I know there'll be a few seconds delay here and there, but please let me know uh, straight away. So anyway, within our hermeneutics, within our Bible study, we get in and we can't see you on YouTube, Sam says. Uh, so came to Facebook. Okay. Can you hear me, Sam? I take it. Okay, people are coming in on YouTube there now at the moment. Uh, Sheila says, sound is loud and clear, everything's good. Okay, great stuff. Thanks, Sheila, because for sitting there, we were wondering if everything's okay. There is definitely a time delay that's happening. There's a fair time delay of about nearly five to five to seven seconds. <clears throat> but anyway, hi, Mercy, good to see you. Sound and everything is okay. Good, good. That's on YouTube, so great stuff. Glad to hear, and then there's a number of people on Facebook. So I'm gonna go straight in. All of you know what this is about already. You've all been here before. Uh, you've all know what we're about. Again, if you've tuned in for the first time on Facebook or YouTube, you're very welcome. Uh, we have plenty of videos on the subject matter that we're doing right now on the area. I would encourage you to go back to them. This is actually, this is back to them because we're halfway through about halfway through we're a little bit we have a lot more to do and uh, go back to them build upon one upon each other and to be able to establish what we're about about uh, studying i'm going to introduce you to the uh, historic development of biblical interpretation how it even began and how that whole area of of Biblical interpretation, the different schools of thought that came up over the years. And we're going to look at that because how they interpreted it, we can learn from them and we can also learn the pitfalls and the mistakes and the different issues. And also see today that a lot of what went on in history somewhat repeats itself again and again and even to today, both the good and the bad. And as we learn about how people interpreted the Bible of the past, it really helps us today. So there's different hermeneutic schools, different interpretative schools of thought as people come to the scripture. And as I said before, every person who reads anything, for that matter, might say in the Bible, has a hermeneutic. They mightn't think it true, they mightn't have articulated it, they mightn't have thought it true, but they do have one. And we just want to learn how to interpret it well, particularly those of us who are called to influence others and say, this is God's word and this is what God says, or for leaders. And so we've looked at many different things. As I introduce to you today the history and development of biblical interpretation, I'm going to introduce to you at least one aspect of the Jewish development. Now, tonight I'm afraid I have to get on to something later on, which is regard to Foursquare, so I will not be actually with you for long tonight. Please note that next week, just to note that next week, carve out the time, would probably be a long video. It might be an hour to an hour and a half video next week. Just please note that because 
there's so much to get involved. But so tonight, anyway, let's uh, kick off. Tonight won't be that long. Uh, looking at first of all the Bible, the Old Testament. Of course, when the Jewish people had the Bible, they too had to learn how to interpret it as time went by. When they had the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, for instance, during the times of King David or during the times of the prophets. They had to look back at the Torah, that is Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. They had to look back at those books and say, okay, what did God say then to them people at that time? And what does that mean for us today? What is God saying to us today? They also had to develop an interpretative and hermeneutic. Now, we don't have a whole lot about that uh, to some degree, because we, again, we're relying on history books, we're relying on extra stuff to find out. There's some internal evidence, of course, as well, when we see how Jesus uh, dealt with the Pharisees and so forth, as they, how they interpreted the scriptures, and even the apostles, or any as the Judaizers, Judaizers, as Paul would call them. And so we can learn something of that. So looking at the Jewish way of interpreting scripture and developing it. Well, first off, we could say that they, like all of us, were to read it and find out the plain meaning of the text. And also to realize as well as that, that they weren't stupid. They weren't stupid. They were, you know, pe there were Jewish people who wrote the Bible under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that God gave the Jewish people, the Israeli people, the ones who struggle with God and struggle with truth. He, he instilled in them. He also spoke to all people through creation in different ways, but particularly to the Jewish people and through Israel that he brought his word, his revelation of who he is and what he's about, particularly through them, to be a kingdom of priests to all people, and a prophetic people to all people. Sometimes they done it well, sometimes they didn't do it so well. Sometimes they applied the scriptures well to their own lives, and sometimes they didn't. And actually part of the scriptural body that we see is aspects of when they did take a hold of the scriptural truth and apply it to their lives well and connect with God well, Yahweh, and times when they didn't, either they twisted the scriptures or neglected the scriptures or in that sense interpreted the scriptures as not being important uh, enough to apply to their lives or leadership didn't do it. And so we see also we have thankfully captured even within the very scriptures over many years examples of when they did apply it or didn't apply it well. We have that also even in the New Testament as well, but we particularly have it in the Old Testament when we look at the area of the prophets and how they were calling the people back to the truth of God's word and applying it to their lives. So when we look at how the Jewish people interpreted scripture, there's one good place to begin, and that is in the book of Nehemiah. Now, I'm going to read it out for you, but I'm going to be reading out from Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. And the time of Nehemiah was the time after exile, they came back into the land, and, and Nehemiah brought leadership, and then also Ezra the priest, and they brought leadership, bringing the people back to God, and building the temple, and putting the temple in place, but also putting the things or the teachings of God in place, and making God first. And bringing God into place. And, and we see how bringing both the word of God into place. But also the understanding of how that is to be applied to them at that stage in their walk with God. Taking the Old Testament that they had. Particularly the Torah. And then bringing the first five books of the Bible. And then bringing that into how is it to be applied within their lives at that time at that place. So in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 8, I'm going to read something to you. I'm going to read out the verses to you from the NIV. <clears throat> it says this, All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. I'm sorry, my phrasing there was totally off. I'll repeat that again. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, meaning the Torah, which the Lord had commanded is uh, commanded for Israel. Verse 2. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. So that would mean children, 
of, a, uh, of an age that could understand. Whatever age that would be, we don't know for sure, but I, I'm guessing at least 11 years of age, the whole, or thereabouts, 11, 13 years of age, depending on a bar mitzvah type thing. So all the children together, verse three, he read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, the women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. So here we see a whole day of reading the Torah, the first five books, and probably more days on it as well as we read. Verse 4, Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him, on his right hand, stood Mathaniah, Shema, Anna, Oraz, oh, Helkiah, Messiah, and on his left were Padeana, Mishanel, Maljeka, Ashum, Ashbadaha, Zachariah, and Meshulama. Isn't it fun reading out those names? Verse 5. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the, all the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they broke down and, or sorry, then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Joshua, Baha, Sherbaba, Jimmy, Akud, Shabahat, Adahor, Mishnah, Keltia, Azra, Johazbab, ha Hanni, and Pelah. <laughs> Again, fun. Instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving them the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Now, here we come to a time, as I said, when the people were open, all the people were open to hear what God had to say and do what God is saying. And so that's the first thing. Their hearts were ready and open. But as you're seeing here, there was a high view of the scriptures, of the, the word of God, the word of the Lord through Moses. And so the people were listening to that, being read aloud. So the first of all is that they were hearing it orally more than writing it, uh, reading it themselves. Because, of course, books were expensive. So most of the time, if you were to hear the scriptures the scriptures were actually read aloud orally and most people listened to the word rather than actually read the word. And through listening again and listening again and listening again, they'd often memorize the word and be able to meditate upon that word and repeat it again and again. Now, you might notice, but I've read out to you the NIV version. And some versions bring it out a little bit more an aspect of verse 8. And I'm going to emphasize verse 8. We're reading from Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 1 to 8, but I'm going to emphasize on verse 8. As the people stood up and listened to the word of God, men, women, uh, and children of understanding or whoever could understand, they're all there listening. And then we see aspects of as they read the law again and again, there was other people there reading portions of the scripture again and again, many different leaders on one side and the other side, and then also the Levite priests as well, explaining the word of God, or it says in verse 7, instructing the people in the law while the people were standing. So the standing is a, is a part of ready to action. It's a part of respect for the word of God, that God is speaking. So, you know, uh, standing up for that. But in verse 8, I want to read that to you again. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. So here we see in the NIV bringing out the fact that making the word of, of God clear, reading the word of God so in a way that people hear it clearly and then giving the meaning. So there's two different aspects there. There's the reading of the word of God clear and then giving the meaning so that the people understood what is being read. 
Now the actual Hebrew there is a little bit different, it's a little bit difficult. And so many of the translations, the NIV doesn't have it, but many of the translations will say this. They'll say they read from the book of the law of God and translating it. Now the NIV does have a footnote. If you have an NIV in front of you, you will see that there's a footnote there. And in the footnote it will say translating it rather than making it clear. And some versions of the Bible say it a different way and then it's about 50-50. Some other versions of the Bible say, for instance, the ESV and so forth and so on, will have translation. I think it's the ESV. I can't remember. Um, so many. There's about 50-50 anyway. Uh, translation, because in the Talmud, it actually, uh, in the Talmud is a, is a Jewish book talking about and explaining the scriptures that this actually making it clear in the Hebrew uh, and some translations of the Bible say translation means translating, that they actually translate it. And so the actual thinking is this, is that the, the people had come out, a lot of them had come out of exile, uh, Babylon, Babylonia, for instance, and that's why they were saying Amen, which is Aramaic, that many of them spoke the Aramaic language, which is a Babylonian language, because they'd been in exile for so long and so forth and so on, and under the influence of uh, Bab uh, the Babylonians, <clears throat> that really, that the people didn't even fully understand Hebrew. They had left a lot of the Hebrew. And that when they were reading the Torah, they read it out in Hebrew, but then they also translated to make sure that everybody understood. They translated it into Aramaic. Now here we come across the first possible translation. It's not a written translation, it's an oral translation. It's the first possible translation. And we've already talked about the hermeneutic of having to rely on scholars to take the Hebrew and Aramaic in places, the Hebrew and Aramaic, and the Greek, Koinonian Greek, Common Greek, and translating it for us into English. And so here we possibly see the first form of uh, the most basic form of exegesis, the most basic form of the aspect of hermeneutics, which is the first aspect, exegesis, of taking out clearly what was actually in the text and translating it to the people in a way that is just clear. So this is the first time we possibly see this as a translation, oral translation may, that it may be, but yet a translation nonetheless. And so, again, we see the first form of hermeneutics, trying to make the scriptures clear and plain. And then with that, if you look at verse 8, of course, I don't have it up on the screen. You'd have to have a Bible in front of you. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 8, it also says, and giving meaning so that the people understood what was being read. So it's not just even reading it well and reading it clearly, but also giving meaning, helping the people to really, what does this mean for them? What did it mean for the people then? Make sure explaining what it means, clarity of mind, that it's not just uh, words, but the meaning is conveyed from the author through the preachers, through the translators, to the people. And so here we see that the people were to get the plain meaning of the text of the law and then how it's applied to their lives so that they could live it out in a reformation, in a revival, a kind of revival, a reformation that was happening at that time. And again and again, we see that throughout history. Haven't we already looked at that a little bit already? That when the scripture is translated well into the English, or I should say the language of the people, whatever language they speak, when it's translated well into the language of the people, and if the people are hungry to read it and to hear it, that God uses that to bring reformation of mind and character and all of that and revival, and to revive whatever is there even among people who maybe once sought for God, but have gone cool towards God. So we see that again and again through history. So hermeneutics, the translation, uh oh, my phone is gone. Please tell me there's no problem with uh, audio. Uh, uh. No, I'm not getting text saying there's no problem with audio, so I'll keep going. Um, so here we see already straight away, we see the importance of getting the word of God to people in meaning. The hermeneutic is so important because if the people don't have a Bible that they can read themselves, which they didn't really want, the Bibles were, the Torah was too expensive. And then even when they did have it, if they couldn't read Hebrew or understand Hebrew very well, even though they're being Jewish, 
if they had been so caught up in the world for so long that they really only understood Aramaic, that they're kind of somewhat lost in translation, as they say. And God cannot communicate to them. So here we see, not only did Nehemiah and the reformers try to build a temple so that they could actually have uh, acts of worship and practices of worship by which God could move among the people, but also we see very clearly that the word of God to everyone, man and woman and child, anyone with a, who can have the intellectual uh, capacity to understand, that it's important and imperative that we build people more than build buildings. Building the people, helping people to know the word of God, hear it directly themselves and as much as possible, making sure they understand the clear meaning of the passage, both in its context and in the context of the people where they're living, both contexts. Context of when it was wrote and how it was wrote and then in the context of the people. And so here, as I said, this is the first area of possibly translationing and reading it out and then explaining the meaning. This is also the first place that we see in a very clear way, expository, what we would call expository preaching, where there's the reading of the law from morning to night into the people. So they get the reading, but also explaining that meaning and getting the meaning to the people. Some scholars even say that when you're reading the text, the way the text is wrote is that the actual went, um, uh, the Levites, for instance, they were going among the people and using a, a form of catechesis. The Talmud and some other things bring out that, that they actually went among the people and were asking them questions and discussing it, making sure they understood that a form of catechesis, uh, question and answer, what we call question and answer, began to arise from there as well. Now, it's hard to know whether that's true or not, but possibly because the tradition of the rabbis kept on going with that type of thing of bringing people forward. Now, I will say this also, that there is some scholars who turn around and then say that at this time also began developing what's called the tradition, the oral tradition. And this oral tradition sometimes heaped meaning on the scripture that was not originally intended by the author, Moses, for instance. And that this oral tradition somewhat skewed then the actual plain meaning of the text, both as the author intended and then ultimately as God would have intended for each person and in their each generation. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Now, we do read in Matthew, we read where in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 and following, 33 to 37, it says this, and again, you have heard it said that the people, the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill the law, the, uh, fulfill to the Lord the oaths that you have made. But Jesus said, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even the one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. That Jesus is making a critique of the Pharisees particularly and the teachers of the law at the time, saying that, you know, the scripture, you heard what it said, talking about the scripture, talking about the teachings, the tradition, uh, says do not, you know, do not break your oath, but fulfill the Lord, to the Lord, the oaths that you've made. But Jesus goes on and says, well, the real deep meaning of this is not about swearing. It's not about swearing at all. You shouldn't be really swearing by heaven or by earth or by any person at all because heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool and you can't even swear by a hair on your head because you can't make it black or white. <clears throat> that you have no control over that. It's, you know, just simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. That is the deep meaning. That is the proper meaning. But Jesus is getting at the fact that the people have put heat on tradition upon the underlining meaning, that they sometimes don't see the actual meaning, what the author really intended, the intention of the heart, the intention of what God is trying to say through the author. Simply don't be making oaths at all, really. Just let your yes be yes and your no, no. When you, when you say to God, I'm going to give you something, that you give it. Don't be swearing at it. 
just give it when I say to God I'm gonna whatever I'm gonna follow you or I'm gonna worship you or I'm gonna uh, do this I'm gonna forgive that person or I'm going to pay that tithe and worship I'm gonna be there at the church service or whatever it is I'm gonna give away this that you do it <clears throat> that you simply become a person of saying yes to yes and no to no that you, you become more integrity and more committed to your words be a person of your words basically and that's the more deeper meaning now so after a period of time at some stage what happened more and more is this tradition of interpretation was heaped on top of the scripture now some would say it happened at the time it began at the time of nehemiah and as that text about ezra and the levites and those people not only making the text clear not only translating it making it clear but also giving the meaning of it now <clears throat> i don't think necessarily that's true I, I i've read some scholars talking about that and i think sometimes they're reading into things that aren't there but either way at some stage it did begin to happen so first of all we see in nehemiah and we see in nehemiah and we see there about the priests and the levites simply wanting to give a clear meaning or the clear translation or the clarity of the scripture reading it out to the people and then just making sure the people had a clear understanding of its meaning and trying to apply that to their lives that is the first thing the plain meaning of the scriptures now we need to elaborate on that and we will but over a period of time what did happen is that whoever was explaining the meaning the rabbis the different rabbis that when somebody was trying to find out okay how do i apply that to my life that often rabbis would say well how you apply it to your life is this Ba 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 ba, and they would give an explanation, and they might even give a story or an illustration, a sermon, basically, of how to apply it to their lives. Now that was handed down traditionally from rabbi to student, and rabbi to student, and rabbi to student, an oral tradition, an oral tradition, repeated again and again. Often, what would happen is the student would actually not only the scriptures, not only the Torah. But would often repeat or to repetition, repeat again the, the teaching that the rabbi would give so that they would know it well. And it would be an explanation on a text. And then they would be able to explain that to the next student or disciple or whatever way. So this oral tradition and by repetition of doing and repetition of hearing and repetition of speaking it out, bringing it out from disciple onwards. So often then their translation, their interpretation their teaching upon the text of scripture often became nearly more noted than the actual scripture itself it was often like this is the way you translate this is the way you apply this text and the only way so the tradition in one sense obscured sometimes the deeper meaning as jesus himself brought out there it's not just about swearing it's about letting your yes be yes and your no no it's about it's not it's not all the nitsy gritties of swearing by god or swearing but it's really it's really just be honest with your word just to be integrity that's the deeper meaning that's the true meaning of it and applying it to your life no matter what era no matter what situation you're in but often these oral traditions were heaped on top of the scripture and so someone could only then at one stage then really read the scriptures through that lens that this oral tradition on top, this spoken tradition, that really, what did the rabbi say? What did the rabbi say? And that's how I should see the scriptures. And so this came in, uh, it just came in over time. And respected rabbis, different things. And it became, in one sense, and that's a human nature, it became in a place where the tradition obscured the bible itself we see that again and again when jesus is dealing with it and this is called uh, uh, an interpretation of school called the mishnah i mightn't be pronouncing that right but it's the mishnah and this whole area of the mishnah it actually means in its in its form uh, i just want to get it up there make sure i got it right it means repetition where have i got my notes here Doo -doo -doo. see even i need notes uh, where did I put it? Mishnah. Do, 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 do. I have it somewhere here. I thought I had. Yeah, 
somewhere, anyway, I can't remember where I put it. It really, yeah, study by repetition. Yeah, I found it. Study by re repetition. So this Mishnah, uh, eventually then what happened was over a space of 350 years thereabouts, all these oral traditions eventually then got put into written form because of course trying to remember them all so they got put into written form with examples uh, examples of how this is applied and so the tradition the mishnah is books that you can get is really then the focal point through which lens you read the torah and so we see it in, now it's from about 200 years before christ particularly and then which i don't think was is before after ezra's time and then of course um then to about 135 AD. So it was even the early church was already even formed by then. So they really put the Mishnah together. So they were trusting these rabbis in their interpretation rather than looking at the scriptures themselves, often looking at this. It and it's these kind of traditions by which, even though they started off plain meanings and stuff, but they got caught in their own tradition and context, historic context, that then even Jesus himself talks about how you nullify the word of God by your tradition. Again and again, we see the Pharisees using what they would seem to call the plain text, the plain plain meaning of the text, but also added on laws or ways that it was to be applied, you know, a certain type of washing your hands a certain way and, you know, doing certain things in a certain way was the way it was to be applied to your life. So these added on laws, these added on stuff. And often Jesus spoke out against that, as in you're, you're using the, these traditions and you're actually obscuring the teaching that is actually there in front of you, or particularly the heart meaning, the heart meaning. Jesus would say, it is written, or it has been said, and then he'd say, but I say unto you, and I say unto you what is really going on there. And so we can have that, you know, without getting into it, because we will get into it later, but we can have that today in modern church today, or tradition, whether it be... a when we say tradition, we might say Catholic tradition or Methodist tradition or, you know, Church of Ireland tradition. But we can have tradition in many ways. We can have tradition even in the sense of how, <clears throat> what the Bible says about how you should structure a church. But elders, plural elders, women, preachers, not women, preachers. We kind of hidden, hidden to that some of that stuff already. How do you interpret it, uh, the text about women speaking in church and so forth and so on? And so we can have traditions ourselves when we don't even realize it. What we're called to do, of course, is hear what the author said as God intended to the people he was speaking to. And then also what is now God at that once, once we hear that, once we really get to that. And what is God saying to us today? So the Mishnah, the tradition, how did that affect the Jewish people even when Jesus came along? And then when the apostles came along with the New Testament, with the gospel? Did the tradition at times get in the way of interpreting the scripture because they already had this filter when it came to interpreting who the Messiah would be? For instance, the Messiah coming not just as a king with rulership and that type of king, but also the Messiah coming as a priest, the Messiah coming as a prophet, and the Messiah coming as a sacrifice. So the tradition often got in the way of able to understand what the actual scriptures were saying. Now we're going to cover two other areas of Jewish interpretation. We're going to cover the Alexander area of interpretation, which is more around the area of allegory. And then even a further part of that, which even goes further, is a guy called Filio, who is a Jewish uh, scholar, who even went further in his kind of allegory type of looking at every text, every letter every number of every letter every phrase of every letter of every word and so we will look at that now as i said i have to get to something else so tonight is going to be very short as i said next week we will continue on with the jewish uh, aspect of interpretation but then we'll also begin to look at how the ap apostolic aspect the apostolic and and translation how the new testament church looked at and how their hermeneutic was on the old testament how some of that and some of the issues there some of the issues about how they interpreted the old testament and then helping us again as we look at that to build up a good healthy hermeneutic ourselves both the pitfalls and uh, the good strengths so now i didn't go into the chat i hope the sound was okay i hope you're okay uh, let me go in there
Oh gee, I have to chat up all the time. Uh, let me see who's in there. Good to see everybody. Hi Diane. Hi. Uh, oh, uh, hi Atlas from uh, Foursquare Dublin. Hi Alish. Hi Helen. Hi Moni. Hi Peju. Uh, Sheila is in there. Let me go over to Facebook. Let me bring that over. Let me go over to Facebook. Sorry, I should actually have that all the time. It was sound okay, breaking up a bit. Okay. Look underneath my first commandment. Not quite sure what that was about, Sam. Uh, okay. Hi, Joy. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Claire. Good to see you. Hi, Tom. Hope you're available to view on later um, on Zoom on Wednesdays. Uh, great. Hi, Ross. Hi, Anne. Great stuff. Well, guys, that's it for tonight. Next week will be longer, okay? Next week will be longer. We will be looking at, as again, further the Jewish way of interpreting, but also the apostolic way of interpreting. And if we have time, it will be a longer one next week. If we get through that fairly fast, I said that will be enough, then we'll actually go into the other areas of interpretation that was going through the Middle Ages, the early church fathers, the Middle Ages, and then the reformers and even modern day ways of looking at interpretation the school the different schools of interpretation down through history so be blessed and be a blessing uh, that's it for tonight let's seek out the plain meaning of the text knowing that when we do that god's temple his people which is more important than any building his people are being built up i'm just going to pop over to youtube here. his people are being built up and his temple is being built up may we have a revival in our hearts, may we have reformation in the church as we all learn how to read clearly what the scripture says and its meaning and interpret it well and bring that to others without adding our tradition to it, but truly getting what God has to say to us today. Amen. Be blessed and be a blessing. God bless you. God bless you.